Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? And this is the last session of the meeting. And um, hopefully this is one of the most important ones where we're going to wrap up the meeting. And our goal at the end of this session is to identify where we're going to go from here. Where are the important areas? What are the needs with regards to the, this field, et cetera? Now, we've heard a lot of great science. Um, I've, you know, normally when I'm organizing a meeting, I don't get to listen too much to the research, but I have focused in on it, and it has been fantastic. And I've learned a lot, and I hope that you have too. And um, the speakers were fantastic. I want to thank all of the speakers for participating, and there's been great interest, and in, um, it's been very uh, stimulating. Um, so, what I wanted to do now is you saw from uh, each one of the chairs of the sessions what they thought the key questions or the uh, most important questions were for their session and, and their focus. So they're going to come up here and we're going to have one chair uh, represent each session, tell what they, if, they, if they're still sticking to their same key questions or not or if they've changed them, okay. And then what I've done is I've actually taken everybody's uh, key questions and I've kind of synthesized them down to six more simpler questions. And then we'll start to hear um, from NIH where we need to go to and uh, what steps we need to take. And I think uh, John McGowan is going to lead off and kind of um, set the stage um, to talk about this. So let's go ahead and get started. So who's going to represent session one? Is that you, Don? Okay. If we could, if we could have uh, the first slide. Oh, there we go. So uh, what we've got here is is just sort of a a slightly modified set of questions from the ones we posted originally. Um, it seems pretty clear to us based on not only the first session but the whole meeting that muscle and bone do interact and really in a, in a really significant fashion tend to co-vary in multiple diverse conditions which is not only development but homeostasis, disease, aging, treatment. And so the, the questions are sort of uh, focused at going one step beyond this conclusion. So. How do mechanical forces and paracrine signals between muscle and bone mediate their coordinated growth, their uh, either coordinated or um, directional differentiation, and again, either coordinated or directional morphogenesis during development? Are there any common signaling pathways coordinating these muscle bone interactions across different physiological situations? And uh, in particular from uh, one of the clinical talks, it seems that conditions under which muscle and bone do not co-vary could be really important for understanding abnormal or disease states as basically a thread to pull to try to, uh, to disentangle the, the probably quite complex biophysical, biomechanical, and biochemical interactions between the two tissues. And then finally, how can we translate results from these developmental studies, which tend to be very, very heavy on molecules and pathways in animal models, to human development, growth, and disease, what kind of therapies can can be aimed at uh, at these pathways? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Don. Okay. And next for session two, uh, Roger. And this one was on aging. Um, just, just a couple of words. I think uh, not only within this session, but I think what I heard throughout the entire meeting is that aging uh, is a, a uh, situation where there are very manifest uh, interactions between muscle and bone. And, and perhaps because with advancing age, both in skeletal muscle and in, in bone structure and function, there are some critical um, uh, decision points that occur that, that really makes this aging a very appropriate model, I think, to study muscle and bone interactions. I think in the muscle area, 
the things that we heard about are, th are that, you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned uh, from the history and the etiology of osteoporosis that can help guide us to understand and quantify and, and determine what sarcopenia is, what the critical uh, objective cut points are for sarcopenia. And, and that will really help, I think, to uh, drive and, and initiate, in some cases, drug discovery and development um, uh, for, for, for compounds that are going to target skeletal muscle mass, but possibly also other, other components of skeletal muscle dysfunction that occur with aging and, and other disease states. And, and some of those targets may be complementary to bone, I think, as well. Um, I, think, I think we still, as a, as a key question, really, because of the societal changes, really need to resolve this, this interaction between fat and muscle and bone. Because, because I think we are going to have a, a population where sarcopenic obesity is really going to be very, very prevalent. It, it's, it's increasing now, and it's going to further increase, I think. So, so I think this, this issue of, of the appropriate muscle mass for a given fat mass and the appropriate bone mass for a given body mass are going to be more and more important in, in trying to understand those body, body compartments. And, and then finally, uh, it's going to be important to, to, to as, as item three said, to determine the biologic pathways that link age-related changes in muscle and bone, uh, because the, the therapies that target both um, organs will, will ultimately be very, have have the high, have high likelihood of being efficacious. So, so really, th those are the things. But I think aging sort of was encompassed in a lot of the presentations uh, throughout the whole meeting. So, thanks. Okay, thanks, Roger. Next uh, session three: common mechanisms employing influencing bone and muscle. Doug? I think after um, our, sh our small session, um, <clears throat> we've concluded that um, there are some pathways that people are, have already begun to explore um, to develop therapies that might um, serve to, to uh, address both bone and muscle. But we hope that through gene discovery, proteomics, um, we might also develop some novel biological understanding of the links between bone and muscle rather than looking under the light post that we already recognize some pathways that could be shared. It would be very um, important going forward not to diverge and have our muscle biologists studying muscle pathways and our bone biologists studying bone pathways, but rather the, last, the point that keeping uh, bone and muscle together on the same agenda and looking for shared biologic pathways is possible. I think um, there are also um, uh, some hope of using the animal models that uh, you heard a lot from Tom and from our Novartis Research Institute speaker about how to translate the preclinical and move it into phase one, phase, and now phase two with some of these pathways. So I think there, this is a good path to, f to follow. And our final point, um, <clears throat> I think you've pro you'll probably hear more about this from some of the other groups about um, muscle as an endocrine organ as is bone. And so I think that there's more here than loading and unloading. And uh, I'll leave that to some of the other uh, sessions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Okay, session four, defective mechanotransduction and repair. Joe. Um, so to sum summarize what we were, what was presented in our session, um, it, this use was looked at in several different areas, ranging from things like space flight to what we have to deal with today in a, a basically a sedentary lifestyle. And it's important to understand what this disuse does to, to both muscle and bone in terms of mass and quality. And that doesn't, while it might sound easy to assess, it's really uh, not that easy. So there needs to be methods to uh, look at this clinically. Uh, in terms of humans. Um, also, it's important to realize that while we think of disuse, also it's very important to look at the recovery because what happens in between bone and muscle can occur at very different rates. 
and uh, we need to have that in consideration, particularly when we're trying to design uh, effective interventions. And intervention, interventions are probably one of the things that was a common thread through all the presentations. For example, uh, one of the speakers talked about mechanical signals, which are critically important uh, in such as vibration and can pay, may be able to play an important role uh, in terms of stimulating growth in bone and in, in muscle mass as an intervention. Uh, and thus, again, it offers exciting p possibilities, but has to be optimized. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we're seeing that we know kind of what the interventions could be for uh, anything from fractures to disuse, uh, but we, they need a lot of polishing and refining. And then finally, uh, successful antibiotic th therapies are going to involve modulation and the activation of stem cell populations. And this specifically uh, was related to, to bone fractures. Okay. Thank you. Now, session five, uh, preventing and treating muscle and bone loss. And it's going to be Nathan. So I think many of us have learned about um, the shared uh, commonalities between muscle loss and bone loss, and, and that interventions to treat one or the other may have beneficial effects on the other organ system. So there was as many questions as answers that were um, generated from our session in re regards to uh, Dr. Uh, Dawson Hughes' presentation, what are the biological mechanisms, either direct or indirect, by which vitamin D affects skeletal muscle quantity, quality, and or performance? You know, myostatin has emerged as a potential therapy for uh, age-related muscle loss and disease-related muscle loss, and it may have beneficial effects on bone if we're able to manipulate that system. But right now, we're still asking simple questions about what act R2A and B ligands should be manipulated to positively affect muscle and bone, and what act R2A and B ligands must be avoided to optimize safety. So that's a continuing challenge that we have to address. Um, Finally, it's not just about drugs, so there was a nice presentation on behavioral interventions, but even here we have questions about what are the independent and additive effects of diet, weight loss, and exercise on body weight, fat mass, muscle mass, and function, and bone architecture and strength in overweight older individuals, and this is clearly uh, a changing demographic in society that we need to be more concerned about, so uh, a number of challenges ahead. Okay, and uh, finally, session six on emerging areas. Uh, Bob, he keeps looking back. Uh, looking <laughs> okay. Well, our area was different from the others in that it was to uh, focus on emerging areas, and we had a series of uh, very wonderful presentations, each of which was sort of encapsulated to itself. So um, the questions actually that we posed were about the specifics of the particular uh, uh, presentations. So I would like to, um, just to take the chair's prerogative, I have the microphone <laughs> and I have a little time, to, um, to request that the NIH consider seriously some um, approaches to technical improvements, technological improvements that I think would help push this uh, a lot further. The first uh, came up this morning when uh, we were talking about uh, Dr. Bloomfield's talk about uh, non-invasive approaches to assess, to assess bone quality. And I, I pointed out that there was one machine which had been run into a, the ground by its commercial developer and it's not, apparently no longer available. But something uh, akin to that that would allow you to determine elements of bone mineral properties and, and material properties as well as geometry in a non-invasive way would really, uh, would really help to push this whole field further. The second is, I, I wish he were here to uh, defend himself, but he had to rush to take a plane because his original flight was canceled and they ran Clint Rubin out of here. But as I recall, there was a very uh, important slide that he showed uh, that's used, it's the log-log slide, where if you look at the magnitude of some phenomenon and the frequency of that phenomenon, that there's a log-log relationship. So if you have, for example, in California, a lot of zillions every day, hundreds of little earthquakes going on at a Richter scale of one or less, and then you look higher and higher, the frequency gets lower and lower, and so that if you have the big one, which if, with the frequency uh, with a magnitude of eight, you're going to only have one every 50 years. And that's how you predict 
when an earthquake is gonna, gonna happen. The same thing he was showing about what you need in terms of a load stimulus to help bone if you're jumping off a three-story building, you only need one hit and that's gonna <laughs> kill you. <laughs> But if you're going to do some things which are more modest in, in magnitude, you only have to have, you have to have more and more repetitions. And what he showed to me was very striking, that there are muscle resona resonations, I guess would be the best word to describe it, that the, just the, the, the fact of muscle fiber contraction initiates very low magnitude strains on the skeleton which is enough, it seems, to maintain the skeleton from going into, an, in, into negative balance. And given the sedentary nature of our population, it seems to me much more practical in the long term to do something that will initiate or replace what, what's lost with age, that muscle resonation uh, profile he showed quite clearly, it's, it's very different in young people from old people, much more practical than to try to say, right, we're going to get a bunch of 65 and 70 year old people to start jogging because I can tell you that that simply doesn't work. So I think that one of the keys is to be able to measure that resonance and I talked with Clint at the at the lunch hour, it turns out the machinery is a little tricky and the uh, coefficient of variation from measurement to measurement is, is not so great. But if, if there were some effort made to improve the technology to get at measuring what this low level muscle function is and then one could do some studies really looking to see what happens normally with age or with illness or with other interventions and to see whether you can actually restore that uh, maybe by vibration but maybe not, maybe by some pharmaceutical, maybe by you know, who, who knows what. But that, getting that technological improvement would be I think a very powerful uh, addition to our armamentarium for studying this whole problem. And finally I just want, I was very impressed by, Ms., uh, by Dr. Studensky's presentation showing the importance of neuromuscular connections and the motor end plates and things. Let us not just focus on the muscle itself. Remember that the key trophic factor for the muscle is to be, to be innervated and that some plasticity in, those, in that is, is well, worth, well worth additional study. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Bob. So what I did is I took all of these key research questions, if you can put up the, the last one, and I kind of summarized it to what components of muscle bone interactions are similar or different during growth and development as compared to maturity and as compared to aging. Second, how do muscle and bone communicate and regulate each other? Are these signals dependent on mechanical loading and disuse? or do these signals synergize, enhance, or reduce the effects of loading and unloading? Third, what is the role of fat, neural regulation, tendons, ligaments on muscle bone interactions? Four, what are the clinical measures of sarcopenia and how to use these to determine and develop treatments? Five, what parameters, either genetic control, function, signaling, growth factors, et cetera, do muscle and bone share and how, when, and where are they different? Should we be thinking about and studying muscle and bone together instead of separately? Should we be thinking about treating muscle and bone disease simultaneously? And if so, what are these treatments? So right now I'm going to turn this over to um, Dr. Joan McGowan uh, for her perspective. I don't think I've ever heard uh, a research agenda quite uh, so clear at, at the end of a meeting like this. Uh, it, it has really been a pleasure for I think all of us at NIH to attend this meeting and you know actually watch the process of crosstalk between two very established and very sophisticated disciplines. And sometimes we all work in silos and it's really nice to be able to look across at the other silo, meet some interesting people, maybe 
see some very exciting opportunities. And I, I think I've seen that happen at this meeting, and, and I'm really very, very, very pleased about it. You may know uh, or suspect that at NIH we have silos too. <laughs> and uh, I hope it hasn't disturbed anybody too much to be working with the, uh, some of the bureaucracy of the way we're organized. But for the last decade, we really have been trying. We've been inspired by some good leaders to try to break down the barriers. Uh, you may not know what these things are, but the roadmap, the major uh, thing that you may be aware of that came out of the roadmap were the CTSAs. The v in the university, the, the Center for Research Translation. We also now have the Common Fund, and every year that is a director's fund that goes to funding trans cross-cutting projects that are exciting, fundamental, relevant to a lot of different fields. The microbiome is, is such a Common Fund uh, project. It's something that needed a lot of resources and needs uh, many different fields to collaborate to identify uh, opportunities for translating this into, uh, into medicine. Uh, we have been at NIH doing a lot of public-private partnerships. Steve Cummings mentioned the FNIH, and I was suspecting that 90% of the audience didn't know what the F stood for. Some of you told me what you thought it stood for, but it doesn't. <laughs> The F in FNIH is the foundation for NIH, and it is a means for us to develop public-private partnerships that allow multiple institutes to work with the private sector as well as the FDA on projects like the sarcopenia project. We have an osteoarthritis project with the foundation, and we also have a bone quality project with, with the foundation where the pharmaceutical companies are actually supporting work that's being done by the academic community and is being um, managed, if you will, by the NIH and the, and the FDA together. So we, we've been working to, uh, to get out of our silos, and I, I, I hope you're beginning to see the results of that. Uh, I think that we, the results of this meeting are going to roll out as investigator-initiated ideas that are collaborative. We're here to facilitate whatever uh, it is you want to do, but I, I do think you're going to be using those boring things that, I, I'm going to say the word, but she wouldn't let me talk about mechanisms. <laughs> Before we came, we tried to get together and, and included our colleagues from NIDCR and uh, NIDDK and put down some thoughts of ways that we thought the collaborative ideas could be put into mechanisms that could be sent to the NIH uh, institutes. Uh, we're available, of course, to consult with you about the west best way to bring forward your ideas. I hope we continue to work with the ASBMR leadership and with the Orthopedic Research Society leadership represented here by Regis O'Keefe with a tremendous interest in this, uh, in this crosstalk. And with any private groups you want to bring to the table, because a lot of our big projects, we do get involved with, with private groups, and uh, by that, not just the ASBMR, but the NOF, the National Bone Health Alliance, the Bone and Joint Decade. All of these things can, can help us to, you know, to move these areas forward. Um, we, uh, you know, have to tell you that we don't expect, and you should not expect, that NIH is going to have what you consider robust budgets over the next couple of years. I mean, part of it is the result of our earlier growth and your growth in, in the academic community. You, you're burgeoning with ideas. You're burgeoning with new investigators who, who have great ideas and, and want to get grants. We're really very, very rich in talent and ideas. And remember that the NIH is very rich, too. Uh, not rich enough, but 
every year, you know, this year, next year, $30 billion or so are going to be going out, and we need you to send us the ideas and make it happen for musculoskeletal medicine. So uh, in spite of what may be constrained budgets, we have to innovate. And this is a very uh, innovative type of meeting, and I congratulate uh, Linda and the, and the planning committee for carrying through this idea. So uh, I just wanted to say as an introduction that I don't have the answer for you right here, but I think together we can, we can develop an answer, and we have a lot of the people that perhaps you, uh, you know on the phone, and now you know in person, but I would like one of them to address Bob's question, because one of the mechanisms that you all don't ever think about probably is the small business innovative research. But right now, two and a half percent of each of our institute's budgets go for small business awards, and it's growing to three and a half percent. And there's another type of award that goes to small businesses that collaborate with academics. This is a tremendous pool of money. And if you want technologic development, I think this is really the way to get it. And, and Glenn has had a couple of, um, has had an RFA and NIAMS has had a couple of RFAs soliciting things from the small business community. The best thing to solicit is technologic developments. You, you might start a little bit with that. No? I said enough about it. <laughs> <coughs> Anyone who wants to mention it? Okay. Introduce well, yourself. Yeah. I didn't. Okay, so I, I'm Glenn Knuckles. I'm program director for muscle diseases with NIAMS. And I, you know, I really think that this has been a great uh, meeting and you know, I applaud uh, Linda and Roger and the other organizers for putting together a meeting that you know, what I've seen is, is really increased communication and better understanding from each of the bone and muscle community about you know, what's going on in the other field, the language that they speak and the motivations for the research that they do. You know, and, and I think that uh, that's a process that really has to continue over time and be nurtured. And if we think about ways that, uh, you know, that we can really kind of grow and expand and enhance the capabilities of uh, a research field that uh, is not restricted to a particular tissue but, you know, is, is driven by, you know, the important questions that affect uh, muscle, bone, other musculoskeletal tissues, maybe even fat. You know, I think that there are ways to use existing programs that we have and even, you know, creative ways that are low cost or even no cost. I mean, one of the things that I think would be exciting is to see, you know, more training programs uh, that involve uh, people with expertise in muscle and bone and other musculoskeletal tissues so that, you know, that'll help uh, feed the pipeline and lead to a cadre of really well-trained investigators that feel quite comfortable, you know, doing skeletal muscle physiology as doing, you know, bone architect microarchitecture studies. So, you know, so that's, uh, you know, we have the T32 institutional training grant program that we've used for many years, and I think we'd, we'd encourage to see more uh, crosstalk among the areas of science in that. So uh, NIAMS has also been using for quite a number of years the P30 core centers program. And you know, that, that would also be a great place to, uh, uh, to encourage applications that would uh, involve both muscle and bone investigator and other uh, in, uh, musculoskeletal fields uh, to develop more novel technologies and to make those technologies and resources available to be able to look at you know, bone and muscle in the same specimens or to develop animal models that will be useful for both communities. And then, you know, lastly for kind of uh, uh, low cost or no cost approaches, you know, I think that there are uh, probably a lot of very interesting uh, skeletal specimens that are being thrown away by muscle biologists. It's probably the same on, on the, the, the bone side. So, you know, what, what's the possibility of developing some infrastructure that would help sharing of those kind of resources, especially given the high costs of animal models and so forth? And maybe that could even be, you know, social media, you know, a Facebook page or something like that that helps support a community and promote 
uh, sharing of resources and uh, further collaboration. So this is just a few suggestions and I really enjoyed the meeting. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm John Williams. I'm the uh, program director for uh, the basic science of musculoskeletal biology in the Division of Aging Biology at NIA. And um, I, I would be remiss if I, I and honestly, I was um, amazed at the amount of uh, interest in aging. I, I did not expect that large of, of uh, of, uh, of interest uh, at, at this particular meeting. So that, that was a pleasant surprise. And so I would be remiss if I didn't mention that NIA does support uh, an aging rodent colony. Uh, so you can actually purchase the, the C57 Black 6. Um, as you all know from budgeting your grants, um, it's impossible to uh, run an aging rodent colony of every possible um, mutation. So we uh, have uh, C57 Black 6. We have the we have the uh, F344 uh, Norway rats. Um, we have uh, tissue samples from these uh, aged colonies uh, uh, stockpiled. So you can buy tissues. You can buy the animals. Um, the caveat being that if you're an NIA funded grant T, you get it at a lower rate than a non-NIA funded grantee, but they are available. So uh, to test a hypothesis, you can buy you know, a small number of animals and test your hypothesis to see if it's worth pursuing in the context of what's going on in aging uh, and, and the crosstalk between muscle and bone. Um, I also, and I, I think all of us being here, uh, should give the impression that um, a, a broad uh, spectrum of NIH people think this is a wonderful idea and um, that it's, people have been talking about it for a long time um, and, and the fact that it has actually been pulled together I think is fairly miraculous um, and, and it's, it's a great thing to see. So um, we hope to uh, see uh, grant applications with all these exciting ideas uh, to evolve out of this and then hopefully that will lead to uh, other developments. Okay, you're, you're together. Uh, I, I, I'm Lyndon Joseph uh, from NIA, so I don't know if you want to hear, hear from another NIA person right now, but um, I guess, you know, I'd like to echo the same things. Um, and I guess I can answer a, a few questions that were, were, were posed um, uh, in terms of how to talk together these, these things. And, you know, um, Joan and, and, and Glenn talked about, about funding mechanism, but one of the things that NIA have that I think you guys should really pay particular attention to is the program project grants, and that will give you an opportunity to bridge the gap between animal and human work. And it will also touch on the translational work as well. Um, one of the things that we do have, um, some people might be well aware of this, are the pepper centers, uh, pepper center grants, which you can do not only training to train particular individuals, but then you can also bring in a whole host of different, um, different um, disciplines to develop a pepper center where you can study anything from cell work to animal work to human work to look at interventions to, to, to help with the aging process. Um, we also have stuff in the, oh, by the way, I'm in the clinical geriatrics and clinical geriatrology branch of NIA. Um, John deal with the human and mechanistic part. We deal with the, the sorry, the animal and mechanistic part. We deal with more the human and translational research. Are you not hearing me? Um, and one of the things that we do have in, in our branch is uh, we have a, a, a special clinical trials branch where if you're really interested in, 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 in looking at a particular type of intervention, whether or not it's pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic, and you bring different disciplines in, and it's going to be an expensive grant and it's going to take a lot of, a lot of resources, we have a, a particular path for that where you actually talk to the program officer, Sergey Romashkin in that case, and between, it's a, it's a cooperation between him, between NIA and you guys. And, and then you develop this, this, this idea for, for a trial, and then which can be reviewed in-house and then go forward. 
Uh, another thing that we do have uh, is the R34 mechanism, which is an infrastructure grant where you can actually <coughs> try to come up with an idea and it gives you, um, Eric Orwell knows a lot about this, where it gives you chance to develop whatever intervention you think are import is important to move forward and you get uh, $100,000 to actually gather all the people who you think are necessary, uh, who are going to be important to that project and then move forward. Um, uh, the other thing I'd like to mention in terms of t technology, um, <coughs> we, the small business grant, as, as was mentioned, a lot of, a lot of academic researchers uh, surprisingly are not aware of it, but it's, it's, a, it's a mechanism that you can use and partner up with a small business to improve on technology, like you're talking about non-invasive technologies, look at, um, um, look at bone. Um, I know NIS over the last cycle has actually funded two such grants um, with academics teaming, teaming up with, with um, uh, small business to look at a uh, non-invasive way of, of looking at um, bone density. So there, there are quite a few ways to do it. It's just that we have to um, talk to us and uh, you know, hopefully we can stay in the right direction. And then there's FNA, FNIH, um, which is <coughs> uh, the Sarcopenia project that Stephanie talked about uh, yesterday. Uh, it was working through FNIH uh, with a partnership with academia and pharma companies to, to, to basically solve a problem that you think is, is of importance. And, um, I will end there. And okay. I'm Karen Weiner from the NICHD, um, which is the Pediatric Institute. So um, I just wanted to congratulate Linda and Roger for a terrific um, meeting, uh, and the organizing committee, and the ASBMR, and Elderkin. Just a terrific meeting. and. Uh, there is really a lot of potential here for pediatrics. I know that many people here, most of the people here probably are thinking in terms of aging, but uh, I notice there are also a lot of pediatricians as well that I've met here. And um, in terms of future directions, I could think of almost an entirely separate um, meeting that could be with completely different um, uh, focus uh, that would be a um, pediatric meeting, the sa same idea, bone and muscle, but with, with uh, sort of a different vantage point because uh, pediatrics is all about growth and uh, reaching, uh, uh, letting, getting children to reach their genetic potential. And, um, and I think that uh, growth in infancy and growth in puberty is completely a completely different model than what you see uh, in in aging. Um, and uh, these things, I think, uh, the interaction of bone and muscle is very interesting. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the um, the talk that we heard from. Um, Clifford Rosen uh, was, was very interesting, the idea of brown fat uh, had, having an effect on muscle and bone. And uh, we know that brown fat is really abundant in infancy and, and gradually decreases. And um, we, we also know that um, uh, muscle, uh, uh, even though there's very little loading during infancy, there's a tremendous amount of increase in muscle and bone during infancy, and we don't really understand how this works. So um, in terms of future, I think we're, we are at the very beginning in terms of the collaboration of these two areas, very vibrant, important areas, and uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And in terms of how to get it done, um, I think you know, the answer to Bob Marcus's question, you know, SBIR is a wonderful, in, in, if you're interested in technology, uh, you, you definitely should look at the SBIR program. I, I know that our institute at the end of, um, at the end of the year, we're always looking for good um, grants and the pay lines are much more lenient for, for this type of um, project. Uh, also, the Common Fund, if you look at the Common Fund, they, there are also mechanisms uh, where you can have drug um, 
um, actually um, develop drugs and um, um, I, I think it's called the RAID and now it's called the Bridge Program, they switched the name. But that's another possibility. So there are a lot of different uh, programs at the NIH uh, that, that you should look into to get your um, mission accomplished because it's really a tremendous amount of work. And then I also wanted to mention the, uh, the pipeline, someone else mentioned that as well. Any of you have K-12s? I know we have three K-12s in the NICHD. I think when you have a, a, an area like this where you're likely to have a lot of innovative new projects, K-12 is wonderful because those projects don't really have to go through CSR. They're institutional training grants. So all that preliminary data can be done just with uh, approval from your local um, whatever committee or whatever you have for, for the institutional training grant. And I know for the training grant that I oversee, fabulous work has been done in the K-12 just to launch these bright new, you know, investigators and, and they do very well as a result. Okay, so you've heard from our panel. And so now I'd like to open it up for if you have any um, questions or if you have any suggestions. Have we missed anything as far as moving uh, the field forward? No, existing. Uh, there are two program announcements, one for RL1s and R one for R21s. It came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, and, you know, in it, it, uh, it encourages uh, studies of any of the things that skeletal muscle does that's not, you know, directly co contraction related. So muscle is an endocrine organ, muscle is a thermogenic organ. Uh, there are bullet points specifically about uh, uh, muscle bone interactions. Uh, it's a program announcement, so it's regular receipt dates and regular CSR review. But uh, you know, we hope that that will stimulate more work in this area. And, and Susan, back at you, um, you mentioned NSBRI and, and NASA during your talk, and it strikes me that um, this type of collaborative work might be very interesting to NSBRI. Uh, what do you think? Um, yes, it should be very interesting. And there are just, uh, the whole point of we, we need to find out where the money is hidden and wherever it's <laughs> hidden. Yes. Bring yes. it to um, because not everybody has heard of NSBRI. So National Space Biomedical Research Institute was founded in 1997, first uh, based on a consortium of nine institutions, but it rapidly was open to all investigators at any institution. And it was founded on a budget line um, out of the NASA budget, but to be separately administered, focusing on biomedical research problems specific to supporting human presence in space. And um, um, it, it, although the initial funding at 30 million a year has been diminished some to 24 or 25 million per year, um, uh, so it's a modest sized program, of course, compared to NIH. Uh, but the whole focus of that was to build, but be, be, by getting people into team structures, to build and foster and encourage interdisciplinary research and cross collaboration, tissue sharing, and so forth. So. On the whole, it's been um, fairly successful at that, um, uh, but the um, dilemma now is that there is um, increasing emphasis from NASA and its human research program on certain research priorities that is rather dominating some of the funding. But the concept is still there, and I think um, once the um, it concerns about changes in visual acuity and changes in intracranial pressure are satisfied with the many projects they did fund this year. Um, it should open up again to more.
projects. But again, it does, the whole design of that was to foster <coughs> interdisciplinary work and crosstalk between disciplines. And we re did indeed have people working um, even, that's how I got involved in radiation effects on bone, you know, because I was exposed to a lot of these radiation biologists. So um, yes, it's a source. Can you be overexposed? Excess exposure. You said you were exposed to radiation biology. Oh. It's yeah, a <laughs> sorry. Joke. Bad choice of terms. <laughs> okay. But yes, so if anybody wants to talk to me further, I'd be happy. Okay. Other questions or comments? Uh, I do have a, actually a suggestion. Okay. Uh, Candice Tahimik, uh, San Francisco Veterans. Um, actually, I would like to um, propose maybe um, some modifications to. Um, somehow foster the uh, career development of early stage investigators, probably perhaps people in the postdoctoral um, area. Now, it's quite obvious to us that the trend in the coming decades, or uh, maybe in this decade, would be um, cross-training in certain disciplines, such as this case. We've been trying to marry the bone and the muscle field um, to somehow st stimulate you know, um, the development, perhaps, of important therapeutics. Now, in the case of postdoctoral trainees, um, in my case, uh, my, tra my training is in stem cell biology. And honestly, it would take perhaps uh, uh, more time to be able to um, get into the field of bone biology. Now in this situation, clearly there's going to be what you call a time um, issue when we try to apply for postdoctoral grants because some of these would require that we would be within a certain period of postdoctoral training to qualify for more postdoctoral training grants. So it would be more difficult to make that cross-training or transition um, into another discipline that we believe would be able to make use of our previous training in a certain discipline. So I don't know whether um, the NIH would try to somehow address that to be able to advance a career of people who really want to take the risk to gain more experience, gain, gain more credibility and knowledge in a new field to somehow be more productive in their research careers. Go for it, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I, you know, I think that, um, so, so, you know, personally, I changed fields from graduate school to postdoc and had an F32 when I was a postdoc. So I think that, uh, that uh, reviewers of those types of grants are looking for candidates who are changing fields and really expanding their, their range of expertise. So, uh, and I think it's, it's uh, probably the same case with our, you know, our K awards that uh, it's, you know, for a period of mentoring, but I know that the reviews, they don't like to see the candidates in, you know, in the same line of training that they've been in all along. They want to see them really taking on some new direction that will, that will you know, help them. Well, the, the other way. thing is, and for you, personalized medicine, because we really <coughs> don't want you to stay a postdoc for too long. Of course, naturally. <laughs> and and there, you know, I think the NIH is very conscious of what has evolved in your academic centers where people can just be so long in their training period. So we have some new mechanisms. We have mechanism that will support people directly after their PhD. Now, that's pretty competitive, giving them an R01 right out of their PhD. But there are other mechanisms that begin with a career development award, a K, K99, and then after two years as a postdoc, you've already written the plan and you need to look for a job, secure a position that we have to approve to make sure that those postdocs get a really good deal, and then you move with an R01-like application. Okay, so thank you. that's the kind of thing that we're, we're I'm, talking to you, but there's a lot of mentors in this room <laughs> who we want to be moving the really bright postdocs they have onto the next stage. Thanks for the info then. We'll help you do that. Mark? Well, first, first I'd just like to thank you all and NIH for supporting this meeting because I think this was a, a really a, important first step and I'm glad to hear you think the meeting went well. And, see your enthusiasm. But going beyond this meeting, I think we all need to 
think about ways that we can sustain the momentum that maybe we've started to build here. I know the ASBMR, Tom and I and Linda were part of a brain, and many of you were part of that strategic planning session where we were deliberately focusing on trying to figure out how we could bring the muscle community into ASBMR. And so ASBMR has that challenge too. But I think all of us need to really, you know, not drop the ball at this point and move forward with, okay, what are some tangible steps that we can take to make sure that you know some of the conversations that started here turn into grants or uh, evolve further? And I mentioned the GO grant that, that NIAM supported. That was the springboard for what has become now a full-blown you know research effort, uh, and and those types of mechanisms too can be very helpful. I know we don't have. Go grant opportunities any longer, but I, I don't think we're going to have ARA come no, around again. No, no, but you know, it was a lifetime experience. <laughs> What's in a lifetime? But certainly, in looking at the funding mechanisms that NIH has, you know, figuring out ways to encourage and maybe give some priorities mm -hmm. to these cross-disciplinary types of projects, I think, would be a really something that needs to be. Maybe it is already there. I don't know. OK. Um, uh, to answer your question, I think the R34, the planning grant that I mentioned, would probably be a good start for that. Because it, it gives you the, the $100,000 to bring p p you know, people from, di from different, different disciplines together to plan a, 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 a grant submission. It could be either small or, or large. So and it, you know, it's, 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 it gives you money for a year. So you, you, you submit the grant. It, you submit it to a specific institute, unfortunately. So you, you go to NIA or NIAMS, and then you have that entire year to plan how you want to submit a grant, whether or not you want to do strictly bone or bone muscle or, you know, however you, however you want to do it, and that can get you started. Okay, uh, Tamara and then Marco. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask if anybody knows about Department of Defense funds, um, because as I remember, I think the first time I ever heard um, Susan Bloomfield speak. She was speaking um, at a meeting where there were a couple of people from Natick, and as I remember, the issues of bone and muscle are a tremendous problem for the military, and it seems like um, this is an area where um, there might be some additional funding available from that source, but I wouldn't know how that was, and I was wondering if any of the um, panel would know. I, I should say that the ASBMR does a pretty good job, and what I know about NSBRI has really come from the uh, announcements. ASBMR, when they learn of a DOD announcement and solicitation for funds, they, they usually put it into the newsletters that you ignore. Uh, it, they have to be directed awards. I mean, they are looking, when they don't have congressionally mandated funds, and years ago we had congressionally mandated funds for osteoporosis, and they have some congressionally mandated funds for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But yeah, it would be good to, to follow up on, on those announcements, but they tend to be more narrowly constructed. I guess I was wondering also whether it was possible to influence the direction, you know, to somehow work with them to see whether they would have increased interest in an area like the interface of muscle and bone, because then that would sort of fund both fields, and it's just an idea. Yeah, our orthopedics program director sits on a board with DOD trying to uh, select, in, in our case, his case, influence their, their priorities, but those are mostly orthopedics directed. Glenn and I will have to influence him to include muscle in orthopedics. Well, I, I sit on the uh, integration panel for the uh, DOD's uh, research program for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and they do have an RFA out currently for, uh, for projects in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And, you know, bone health is really a problem for, for that. Uh, um, for that community of pediatric patients with a really high fracture rate and, and you know, complications of corticosteroid treatment. So if anybody's interested in that kind of topic, I think that it would fit very well with the DOD's RFA. Okay. 
Okay, and we have time for just one last question. It's not, it's a, a, a suggestion. Many of us that actually attended this meeting were at the Psychopenia Summit in May. Something fantastic you know, that the foundation of NIH did was creating a secure website where all the presentations were uploaded as PDFs. And that was, was really excellent, you know, as, as, as a source of continuation of the collaborations and, 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 and the reference. And so that's the suggestion. Okay. Thanks, Marco. So I know a number of people have flights that they have to catch and they're very anxious or otherwise I would love to, you know, keep these guys longer. And uh, there's two groups I need to thank. And first of all, uh, these five individuals were brave enough to come up on a panel without really knowing what was going to be happening. So, um, and I think uh, we've learned a lot and they've done a fantastic job. So let's give them a, a big round of applause. Now there's another group that I haven't uh, thanked yet and that's uh, ASBMR. And the staff has been fantastic in helping to organize this meeting and also helping with the workshop. And I especially want to thank Ann Elderkin who, uh, you know, guides me around and keeps me on the right path. And uh, also Stacy Barnes and Holly Gumbel and um, M Melissa Huston and I think, and Erica too. And I know I've kind of um, sprung uh, things on them at the last minute and, and questions and this type of thing, but they've just been fantastic. So let's please give them a hand also. And finally, I want to thank all of you sticking it out until the last minute. This, this is fantastic. Um, just to let you know, we will be preparing a summary and perspectives that we will be submitting to the uh, Journal of Bone and Mineral Research, which we hope our reviewers will accept without too many revisions and certainly won't reject. You, you never know what you're going to get. Um, the other thing is it's, uh, some of you were saying, let's keep it up, let's sustain the momentum, et cetera. So as organizer of the ASBMR 2013 meeting, the day before, we will have a muscle meeting to hopefully to um, promote and sustain this initiative. So thank you all, all and please have safe travels home. <laughs>